The following interview was conducted with Professor Joseph Walensky, Professor Emeritus of Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, November 13, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Walensky. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start by talking about where you were born and your parents in early years, grade school and high school. Okay. Born in Chicago. What year were you born in? 1930. Okay. This was about the year after my parents had arrived in the United States. Where had they emigrated from? Uh, it took them eight years to get into the United States. You want to make a, a from comment? From Ukraine. They snuck across the Dnieper River at night into Romania in about 1921. They were in Kishinev for two years. They, they were married at that oh time. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were in Kishinev for two years. My older sister was born in Romania. They then applied for a visa to come to the States, received a visa, traveled to Holland, get on the boat, and the day before the boat was to leave, for the U.S., the announcement came that the borders of the United States were shut down. There were no immigrants to be allowed. What year would this have been? This was 1924. What was the reason for that? I have never looked into that. That's interesting. And so they were stuck in Holland for two years. They were sort of taken care of by the steamboat company. My second sister was born in Rotterdam. And they saw little hope of getting into the States at this point, but my sister had a brother who had arrived in Canada a couple of years earlier, and so they applied for admission to Canada, and they were accepted, and so they made the trip from Holland to Montreal, and lived in Montreal. By boat, of course. By boat, of course. And they lived in Montreal for about two or three years. And that's where my third sister was born. And then, with the assistance of a sister of my mother, who had been in the States for about eight, ten years, they were in Chicago, they were able to get into the States, settled in Chicago. And I was born a year later, in 1930. I went to Kosminski Grammar School. And High Park region in the south side of Chicago. What, oh, let me ask you, was your father able to find employment? What sort of work did he was able to my do? My uncle, my mother's sister's husband, was in the hand laundry business. And he set my father up in that business. Not only set my father, but my mother's brother, who also came from Canada, in fact, set him up in business. And they were all located in business about I'd say two, three miles apart on the south side. My father's business was at 47th Street in South Park, which is no longer South Park. It's now Martin Luther King Drive. Oh, okay. And he was, was in that business until he retired about 20, 30 years. Very good. Very tough. Yeah. Open 7 in the morning, close at 7 at night, 7 in the morning on the weekends, 11 at night on Saturdays. And, you know, as I say, it was, it was a struggle for them. I mean, I went to Hyde Park, graduated from Hyde Park High School. Well, any activities to tell us about high school? Are there any clubs or anything? Yeah, I was there? a okay. sports guy. I was tall, so I basketball? played basketball. Okay. You know, I was captain of the varsity team in my senior year, played baseball. You couldn't play more than one sport with an inflated ball. So I would like to have played football. Since I played basketball, you really? weren't permitted to play <laughs> football in those days. Interesting. Now those rules and regulations have, have vanished. <laughs> we never heard of those. So when I applied to the University of Illinois, I was accepted at Navy Pier, two-year institution. I played basketball and baseball there. I started out as a chemical engineer and soon realized that wasn't the place for me, so I switched to chemistry. In my junior year, I went downstate to Champaign-Urbana. What was the enrollment there? And it was primarily at local, I think. Maybe here? Yeah. I think it was no more than a couple thousand. 
Okay. Yes. But it was all, they had, there wasn't any resident facilities, so you just, it was no day. No resident facilities whatsoever. There was a movement underfoot at that time of breaking into a four-year institution, not at Navy Pier, but building a separate facility elsewhere in Chicago. Are they for, and this, still this, under uh, or This banner. came to be about four years later. That's how Chicago Circle started. Okay, okay. It was Navy Pier, and then they had these grandiose plans of building not only a four-year institution, but a graduate school and everything sure. as well right. at Chicago Circle. And so um, I had no contact with Chicago Circle, unfortunately. It didn't exist in my right, day. Right, exactly. In my day, it was strictly Navy Pier. It was two years, and that was it. Well, make a comment. Your wife also was there. Tell about the archery where they had a... Oh, my. Well, Navy Pier, I don't know if people are familiar with Navy Pier. It's this long installation right on it the It is lake. a pier. It's a pier, and there were classrooms, and there was a separate gymnasium in the front, which served as parking lot. They also had physical ed classes, which were held at the very end of <laughs> Navy Pier. And my wife took this archery course. She claims she shot more arrows into Lake Michigan <laughs> than she hit the target with. <laughs> and it upset her gym teacher <laughs> mightily. <laughs> But anyway, we both went down to Champaign or Banner for our junior year. And you, then you got married? Got married our, our junior year. Okay. Actually, yeah. And then, I don't know if you want to hear the story Go about ahead. going to grad school. Sure. I worked. Let me, uh, and, and since you were married, did you do so? Were you working there while you were in school, a student? Or yeah, I was. I actually, I had a job as sort of a waiter. Tell about the lab, the undergrad research thing that you were involved in. That wasn't work, that was a course. Okay. I know, but and I think that's kind of good because of undergraduate research, between, because today they're doing a lot more of that. Well, doing a lot, they did a lot at Illinois. When I came to Purdue, they did very little in the way of senior research, or undergraduate research. Right. Now we have undergrads starting as freshmen. That's right, exactly. Right. For the best, that's probably the greatest experience that they can have coming to Purdue. Sure doing research for four years. That's right. In fact, there's many, many people. I was an advisor, chemistry advisor for 30 years mm -hmm. at Purdue. And, and so I had an opportunity to sort of steer my advisees into research. Yeah. And I know I dealt with a number that came here as a freshman, who worked two, three, four years in research. In fact, there was one who graduated in three years, spent three three years in research. Worked with Phil Hooks for his last two years and ended up with about five or six publications as an undergrad. Went to Harvard for his PhD, then got a faculty position at the University of Washington. And we tried to recruit him back to Purdue. <laughs> he says he likes territory out in the <laughs> West Coast too much so we just couldn't succeed in luring him back to Purdue. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I did senior research at Illinois, myself and about 17 others, huge group of people. And the procedure was that you went to see this one professor for graduate school, Speed Merville, Carl Shipp Merville, who was one of the best known organic chemists in the world. And so I went to see Merville, told him what my desires were. He asked me whether I had any geographic preference. I said, no, except for the South. He said, fine. Any particular schools? No. Came back to see me the next day, told me, you've got an appointment at Cornell University as a research assistant. Here, I hadn't even applied to <laughs> Cornell, and yet I had this no, no research doubt. assistant. Chip, it's all set up for me. So that's where I went, Cornell. Was there for four years. What did your your wife graduate? What did she major in? It speech. Oh, okay, good. English. Okay. And, uh, we started our family about the second year of graduate school. So by the time we left Cornell, we had our first two children. So that sort of ended her career. Sure. Although for the first year she worked in the vet school, the vet school library. Oh, good. <laughs> of all things. Yeah. How'd you like Cornell? I like it. It's cold up there, though, in the winter. Mm -hmm. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't, wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice the cold very much. Yeah. 
I took a postdoctorate at the University of Wisconsin. That was cold. Because I can remember parking the car and walking in towards the chemistry building, the winds blowing off the lake there. Oh, that was goes right through you. That was tough. I spent two years at Wisconsin. Got this position at Purdue. Came to Purdue in '58. Never left Purdue. How did the uh, uh, offer come? Did, was it was it lit advertised, or how did you have to? It was advertised. Okay. I interviewed for. But Earl McBee would have been. Was he the de Earl, head at that Earl time? Earl was head, and Earl was notorious for hiring people sight unseen, which meant those hirees had no chance for <laughs> promoted within the department. I still consider Earl to be the best department head that I worked under. Uh, and I worked under a lot of people. Mm. Why was he the best? Because he was a dictator. And everybody in chemistry disliked this approach. And so the entire faculty band together. We really acted as a single unit on every issue that you can imagine. And when Carl was replaced by Joe Foster, just everything sort of fell apart. Everyone started to go, everything's for me. Instead of being for Her. us, it became for me. And I really felt that Earl was a tremendous catalyst in the background. So all the, I can tell you all kinds of stories of Earl McBee locking up the library, not allowing faculty access until there was enough complaints where he granted us keys, or not allowing anyone to use the passenger elevators was for his <laughs> own private use <laughs> until he discovered something was wrong one day and he called in the repairman and the repairman said, this is going wrong because no one's using this thing. <laughs> and so that was the time when the elevators got open to the public. Sure. So. Little side lights like that sort of enriched the daily activities. But he was the, this would have been, he couldn't use the library when it was closed and then, so he had the keys. Mm -hmm. okay. Afterwards we got keys so we could go in. Sure. But um, I was hired at the time of Earl being the department head, and he, there were three faculty brought in at the same time. Two were sort of hired sight unseen. I was granted the privilege of a full interview. So I came to campus, I gave a talk to the chemistry department and so forth. So I had that advantage over the other two. One young man just shouldn't have been hired, period. He just was not fit for an academic institution. He lasted for a year. The other, Paul Peterson, actually was a first-rate organic chemist, but he did not get tenure. He left, went to, I think, first South Carolina, I think, and then to St. Louis. He actually established a very strong research career for himself. Mm -hmm. That's the, the way things work. I know, that's right. Now, you, were, that you would have been in Weatherall. Because Brown wasn't built. Brown wasn't right. built. And that's a long story on, on its own about Brown that I could relate to you. Because I was heavily involved with some of the planning of the Brown building. Okay, well, that's good. We can talk about facilities. So anyway, I, I arrived at Purdue in 1958. That's it. Where, where did you people live when you first came? You had a couple, you know, what, three we children rented a, We rented a Purdue house in okay. Lafayette on State Street. I don't know if you're familiar with State Street. Sure. Cross Street were all these mansions. Yeah, right. <laughs> but Purdue had one house that they owned. And it was convenient because at that time, Tubby lived on 7th Street. And so when they sent people out to take care of Hubby's place, it was not that difficult to come by and do whatever was needed in our sure. Yeah, Purdue took care of that because it's the PRF. And then we, we, we lived there for a year, and then they said they weren't going to rent it any longer. They were going to sell the facility. And so we had to look for a place to live. And actually, the person that found our current house is Sarah Brown. Her Browns, our Nobel laureate's wife. Why? Was she in, did she, was she in real estate, or no. she just happened to know about the house? No, we were very close friends sure. of the Browns. Sure. And um, this was a house about a block and a half from where they lived. They lived on Garden Street. Okay. And our place is about a block and a half down on Elmwood Drive. So she actually found the house for us. Okay. Well, we nice. moved in in 1959 and we're still living. 
It's nice. That's nice. Have a mood sense. Yeah. Well, then go on and tell some other. Uh, you want to tell about some of the committees and okay. things that you I really divide my career at Purdue in the, the three categories okay. research, which I'm not going to really say anything about. Because if you want to find out about my research, I've got about 90 publications. You can make it for you can, the research or just a comment. You can go to chemical abstracts. You can go to citation index. You can go to the library to look at copies. You might just mention the focus in which it, just for the researchers. And they know the sources, but just to okay, make I was, a comment. My work was in what I call natural products. Okay. We did a lot of work with synthesis, structural elucidation, with things that smell good. Terpenes. The second facet is teaching and my work with students. Good. And the third facet was service to the university, both to the chemistry department and to the university in general. The ground building is what I consider service. The safety committee in the chemistry department, the chemical management committee at the university level. So, let me just say something about, I brought some documents over, which I'm going to leave with you. Right. My teaching awards. Good. Okay. You can, well, you can make a comment when I ask about awards and make a comment, but that's okay. good. Can I, let me just start with that. You want to start with that? Yeah. Okay, let me start ahead. with the awards. It starts out go ahead. aspect of teaching. Why did I put this together? When I was inducted into the Book of Grades, that's teachers. one award I know you have. Yeah. You won the inaugural. Won the inaugural. There you go. The question came to mind, would someone in the future know why I was inducted or nominated to this group? Would my children, would my grandchildren know? And so I consulted with the secretary to the department head in chemistry, Donna Wilkinson. I asked Donna, would you please look in my file? And would you determine what record you have of my teaching awards? And you see this list. She came back and said, oh, you've got about four or five things listed. I said, really? I knew there were twice that number. Mm -hmm. I said, Donna, would you please contact the science school and the chemical engineering department and find what record they have of my teaching awards? Now, you know this whole list being one of the top ten teachers in the science school to the place where I won the Outstanding Teaching Award in Science. The science school had a record of one of these in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And the Chemical Engineering Department had no record whatsoever of my ever winning any kind of award. So in retirement and cleaning out my files, I went through all my papers, threw away a lot of stuff came across documentation for each and every one of these things, which I made copies of, delivered to That's Donna, and said, Donna, please put this in my chemistry file. So right. in the future, if anyone wants to find out something about Joel Linsky, this material will be available. That's very nice. And I uh, interject that many of the people that I have previously interviewed have started to pull as part of preparation for it, even though they know that I do the research, have started to put together some things, which is really nice, and they said, I, I really should have done this some time back, but you sort of put the focus on it, so this is very so good. If you had wanted to look oh, yes. into this, you would. I will make a copy and send this back to you. No, I've got this. Oh, do you? Copy. Okay. Yes. Let me ask you this. How did the chemical engineering, because you were in the chemistry department? I taught organic chemistry for my life. I started out at Purdue teaching general chemistry for home economics majors for 11 years. That was, there was a required course for them, I assume. For them, yes. okay. And it was called School of Home Economics, no longer. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I dealt with that clientele for my first 11 years. I did s teach some organic chemistry courses at the same time. Uh -huh. These were sort of upper level sure. courses. Okay. In my 12th year, I got the assignment of teaching the introductory organic course. This is for the chem majors and chemical engineers. Oh, okay. Chem 261 and Chem 262. I taught that for about five years. And then I switched to a different organic course, which was largely taken by biology majors, ag students, pre-meds. And then I got switched back to the chem major, chem e course. 
and so forth. So it went back and forth. So this is my contact with Kim Mead. Good. Okay, that's very good. I had their students in this organic course. And they would poll their students when they were juniors and seniors, asking who were their top professors. And that's where I came up with these two awards from the chemical engineer. That's very nice. The reward was simply a letter, because they said they would have liked to put me up for the Amico Teaching Award. This is the top award. But I had already won the Amico Teaching Award. And I think it's called the Murphy it's Award. It's now the Murphy, that's yeah. right, yeah. And they said, once you win that award, that's it. You're no longer eligible to be reconsidered again in the future. That's interesting. And that was the same thing for being voted the outstanding teacher in the science school. That was again because of in the, the whole school. That was they told all the students in science. And this was not a class evaluation. This was afterwards, and they solicited nominations for their outstanding teacher, and for the first six, seven years when they were doing this, I was voted one of the top ten until finally I was voted the very top as the outstanding teacher in science. And once you won that, <laughs> you, you were blacklisted. You no longer could be put on the even list of potential candidates for about five, seven years. So you see that gap <laughs> in, in years, in the yeah. 80s to the 90s. <laughs> that, that was the reason for that gap. The gap was I was not eligible to even be considered in those years. <laughs> to be, it could be TBD, to be determined. <laughs> and then the Frank Martin Award was, each year there was different voting taken out. Some years it was in class for a service course, in class for the majors, and then other years polling the juniors and seniors and sophomores for who they felt was their best instructor. And that's where I came up with the Frank Martin Award in Chemistry. Okay. The two years that I won the award, it was largely, again, based on poems taken, of not people in class. That's very nice. But that's kind of extra special. Well, I, I figure that's the best way you find out about right. what people are doing in teaching, not by doing student evaluation. Because you can do all kinds of gimmicks to play up yeah. to the students and become the popular man on campus. I never believed in that. Right. Yeah. And then I brought this document along, which I'm going to leave with you, okay. which deals with student and teaching and student relationships. Okay. Okay. Um, my 30 years as academic advisor. My Were you the primary person, or were there others doing it? Or I was head advisor in chemistry for about 20 years, and I had about five to seven other faculty working with me. It's detailed okay, there. Okay, good. Okay. I, would be, I was thinking of for the research. I maybe. would be the individual assigning. These were only juniors and seniors. We wouldn't handle the freshmen and sophomore. That was handled over at the uh, science school. Okay. There was a single counselor advisor handling all our freshmen and sophomores, but when they marched up to the junior year, they were turned over to a faculty member in the chemistry department. Okay. I'd be the one that would assign the students to different faculty. And I always made sure that I would get twice the load <laughs> as anyone else, so no one could com complain. And generally I tried to steer some Smart of the... Smart planning. I tried to steer some of the better students to the other advisor. I occasionally took some of the best you get much less complaints when you have to advise top-notch students. It's like my fondest memory are advising some of the best students. That's right. It is nice. You get a student who's tested out of 53 hours of classwork. There's nothing like that. That's a challenge. <laughs> what the heck do you tell this guy to take? <laughs> in fact, this, yes. this fella, I put him into every graduate chemistry course that we had available. Four of those. Another thing I relate in there, Kumar Kadiala. His father is still, I think he's now retired, he's emeritus, somewhere maybe around the Cranford Department or economics, I'm not sure exactly, but Kumar was a chem major at pre-med who I took on as an advisor because I had him in class. And I have never forgotten the fact he came into my office and said, you know, I've taken all this math 
two, three years of math, beyond calculus, when am I going to get a course that challenges me? Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, Kumar got a fellowship to attend Stanford Medical School, so his total way at Stanford was paid for. So he was a bright guy. Those are the kind that you really relish to have come in. They're challenging to work with as well. They're challenging, yeah. All right. And the others, as I've relayed in, in that document, they, after a day of two or three advices coming in, and they don't know what they want. They don't have any idea what to take and so forth. And you're just racking your brains how to deal with them, what to tell them to take, and so on and so forth. And you also find a story in there about Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown is Herb's son. I was his advisor. I won't relate this to her. Okay. You can read about I'll read it. That. We'll add that to the Because Charlie was really one pain. He is the only person on two or three occasions I had to send to the dean of the science school. Because I told Charlie, you can't do this. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and the, every time the dean would approve exactly what he wanted. Yeah. So anyway, I, I dealt with that. You also see instances of cases of dishonesty because I felt I really ran into some very major incidents in my years. There was always a thorn in my side. Why doesn't the university take stronger action against people who are cheating? And that's a long story all its own. And I relate some of my interaction with Steve Akers on this issue because Steve was pretty much in charge of this action for some years. And I got to know Steve very well got to hear his side of the story, and I understand, really, I finally understood where he was coming from. Sure. And I relate my last incident of a football player who was cheating, and Steve's utter, total frustration over that case, to the point where he got the student suspended, and the student appealed the suspension and the suspension was overruled. <laughs> and so the student was back on campus and did the same tricks coming back from campus. He was caught again and was finally thrown out of the university. Each one of these things was related to me in great detail by Steve. So anyway, and then finally, in the last part of that document deals with how I assign grades. Because this was a very, very time-consuming proposition. I suspect I'm the only professor on campus that did things the way I did. Uh, the time, the effort, every borderline exam, final exam, was regraded before it was handed back to students. And who regraded them? I did. Sometimes meeting, I had to regrade 50 to 100 papers. And the time that took to deliberate with the help of teaching assistants and whether students could get an A or a B, a B or a C. So I never had anyone appeal a grade that I gave in my 44 years. I did serve on the Great Appeals Committee, <laughs> so I know did. that students did appeal grades. Oh, yeah, they still do. So anyway, that, that's that, yeah, that part, That'll of, be good that part of my career, so you can read. I will. Some interesting. And pay close attention to the case of Debbie Ziegler. That's a case which is so unique in the annals of the university. And I think the solution is so perfect. And it wouldn't happen today, as I point out. Okay. I'll be interested. I'll make but a observation. Something that Bev Stone and I got our heads together and worked out. And I think it really saved this young lady in the long run. She did get kicked out of the university, but it saved her in the long run because yeah. she, she re entered. And I've been trying to Google her, and I'm not sure, but I found someone with that name who was an internist in Indianapolis, because I was sure she was going to go into medical profession. I think she eventually did. Oh, maybe. But I'm yeah. not sure this is the same one. Yeah. Okay, and that's, other, that's that other facet. Category. Okay, now you're the, on the last facet gets me down to the service for the chemistry department okay. and university. We'll start with our safety? You want to start with safety, so yeah. Whatever you, it's your ball. Henry Foyer was... For years and years, I don't know if you know Henry Foyer. Mm -hmm. He was for years and years chairman of the safety committee 
in the chemistry department. Let me ask a question. Was that unique to that department, or were there other departments on campus you think that had safety committees? There were some. Okay. okay. Not all. Okay. I asked that because maybe the researchers, was chemistry the only one, so that's why No, it wasn't that. the only one, but okay. since we were probably the department most heavily engaged with issues relating to safety. Right. We were probably the ones most organized in that area. By the way, when Henry retired, Dale Norgen sent me a memo appointing me as safety chairman for the chemistry department. And what did this mean? Well, first of all, it meant teaching an extra course. And I brought you an outline from one year as to what that course involved. All right. It meant um, once a week, generally in the spring semester. For whom was the course? Who took this it? was taken by every graduate student in chemistry. Okay, so it was a graduate. And then level. later, it was required of every graduate student in the chemical engineering department. And then when it became known, it became required of every graduate student in pharmacy and in health science. So it was very strictly a graduate course. Mm -hmm. I gave no exams. Was grades, it pass, no pass? Grades were uh, satisfactory, okay. unsatisfactory. So essentially pass, no pass. Sure, okay. And the grade was dependent upon attendance. So everyone was assigned a seat. And my secretary would stick her head in the back of the room at the end of the period, look at the empty seats. And so we knew who was there and who wasn't there. And it was rare that I gave them the satisfactory for their course. And it evolved, it changed, the topics changed, the people, I would give about the first four or five lectures and then I get experts in different areas. I see you got Paul Zimmer there and uh, yeah, Paul and Roger Mako, whom I met, who's Roger, deceased now. He spoke on AIDS. There yes. was a time when AIDS was just at the forefront. He only gave two lectures, two different years, because then the AIDS controversy sort of died down yeah. and I replaced with other topics. He came from the medical school, didn't he, in Indianapolis to the pharmacy, yeah. Yeah, he, he was the one that certainly was the expert on campus that could speak on that mm -hmm. particular area. And we had people like Fred Lytle coming in afterwards. He's there, yeah, laser mm -hmm. safety. He's You're right. That was actually required. Anyone who was gonna do laser research was required to so occasionally we had a few outsiders come in because they needed this lecture to be certified in handling, <laughs> uh, handling lasers. They take advantage of the opportunity. <laughs> and then I got great cooperation from the fire department because they, had, they were responsible for about three weeks of the course. They came in and talked about first aid, mm -hmm. firefighting in class, and then there was generally a field trip that the entire class would take. We'd get them on buses and take them out to some isolated area. And the fire department would build fires and the students would actually put them out. I'd sign up for the field trip. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's one aspect, yeah. minor, actually a very minor aspect. <laughs> the other part of being safety chairman is you organize a safety committee. Graduate students, people from the shop, people from the physical part of the department, no other faculty. And then we did safety inspections of the entire chemistry facilities. Weather, then when ground was built, every nook. And I've been in every nook and cranny of both of those buildings, places no one has ever seen. In fact, there's a, a large room in the basement of Weather Up. It's right across from the passenger elevator. I was sort of shocked when I went in because there were murals painted on both walls. And to this day, I have no idea who's responsible for their murals. Mm. And to this day, I think they're still there. They're still very interesting. I wanted to go back and revisit them. I couldn't get back in because the keying for that, that facility had been turned over to the physical plant. Chemistry no longer control access. Because basically, it was a large room which was a wind tunnel. It was an air handling facility. It wasn't used for anything else but being there. So uh, that's a f place that no one in chemistry knows about. I don't think anyone on campus knows about that spot. Okay, so we did building inspections. Odors, anytime there was an odor release, I generally call, hey, we've got something that stinks. Could you come down? 
figure out what's going on. And when things really got out of hand, I would put together a memo and send it out to the department. This week's this week orders at Purdue listing some of the main events of the week. And then at the bottom pleading. This would go to everybody in chemistry. Every graduate student, every faculty member, every secretary, everyone working in the shop. And when we had bad weeks and You circulate you sent this out once a week? Just when there was a reason for it. No, it didn't go out once a week. Okay. Just, Just when, when we had a flare up, like here this in uh, 1988, this week of 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, we just had a, a flare up of accidents, fires, evacuation of the building because someone in mathematics, they were taking a math exam and someone called in a bomb threat, so the building got evacuated. A nice explosion in Dave Gorenstein's laboratory. And I figured I had to communicate these events to everybody in chemistry. And, and you see, not in a very serious way, but how to get the message across, hey, these things are happening. Take care of yourselves. Be safe. So there would be about three or four of these a year that would be sent out. I spent hours and hours looking for all that's a That's a I big can, job. I can tell you stories, but I'm not going to take the time. No. And then finally, that's now we're getting closer to my getting into chemical management. I called myself the chemistry garbage man. You know, we had to write annual reports to the president, and that was the title I used. I am the chemistry garbage man because I was literally responsible for major cleanups in the chemistry department, making decisions on what to do with chemicals, whether to recycle them, or to dispose of them, so on and so forth. Nathan Kornblum retired. He left six cabinets filled with chemicals. I had to in go. his office. No, in the attic. When Bill Truce retired, three cabinets filled with chemicals were moved up to the attic. I had to go through each and every one of these things. When Bob Benkazer retired, these were still in his laboratory, so I didn't have to work in the attic. But attic wasn't an inconvenience because my office was in the attic. <laughs> and so I had to deal with all the chemicals that Bob Benkazer had to be disposed of. And all of these things, some of them were put into a big cage in the attic for redistribution. Free chemicals, we used to call it. So if anyone wanted any of these, they can go out there and help themselves. And after they... I assume they're all labeled, though. So oh, these know. were all labeled. These okay. were in good condition. Okay. This was not junk. When they had to get rid of the attic, because they had to move something else up, they moved all these chemicals down into the first floor stock room. And I have a feeling some of these still are down there. Probably. And then the rest of the stuff for disposal were brought down into the basement. And the basement was the the room of horrors. This would have been in uh, Weatherall? Weatherall. Uh -huh. Just shelves stocked to overflowing. Things piled up along the walls. And they really didn't have a convenient way of disposing of these things. They would contract a courier to come in maybe once, maybe twice a year, sometimes every other year. It was tremendously expensive to dispose of this material. Because yeah, we didn't have expertise in, in those days. To handle it. Yeah. And so they come in with a 55-gallon drum and put about 12 containers into a 55-gallon drum. Of course, they pack it with vermiculite, then put a few containers in, then cover it with vermiculite, put a few more containers in. Until it gets filled up. Until it gets filled up. So it cost a fortune just to dispose of a small amount of waste. They had a hazardous chemical facility on campus, which I don't think anyone knows. This was a separate building that was near the transportation depot on the ag side of campus. I went over there once and I swore I would never go back again because there were things in there that really scared me. Why did? You know, I've had a career around chemicals. I've dealt, not handled hazardous chemicals. But this place literally scared me. There was a cage. I would think so. There was a cage in there and I got into the cage and looked around. There were 
organic perchlorates with the name Dale Marjoram. Um, Dale Marjoram, one of his graduate students in the 60s, Bob Woodruff, had been grinding this stuff and exploded and blew off a couple fingers. So when you see this stuff, oh my God. Hydrogen peroxide. Most people aren't concerned with hydrogen peroxide. Most people use it 5, 10% safe. When you see 90, 95% hydrogen peroxide, uh -uh. you don't want to be around that. That's powerful that's, stuff. That's nasty stuff. Sometimes just a speck of dust getting into the container, and it's gone, it's blown up. But these kind of horror clauses existed all over campus, not just in chemistry. Chemical engineering, pharmacy had their places where they were sort of shoving the waste in. And so there was a realization that we needed a facility. Right. And this was assigned to Strether Arnott, who was at that time vice president of research. And he'd been in biology. He was in biology. Right. Yeah, right. Biological science. Yeah, he's left Purdue yes. many, many years ago. Right. But Strether appointed an ad hoc committee. Bill Batinger. Batinger at the time was in chemistry. He worked with me many hours on the safety committee. I mean, he was a right hand. He was a blessing to have around. Because I don't know many hours we spent together <laughs> smelling <laughs> <for> odors. <laughs> oh. I was on this committee. Okay. Bob Squires from chemical engineering. Bob Smith from biology. Gordon Bourne, that represented pharmacy at the time. We were assigned the task of finding a solution to this waste problem. And Bill Bader was sort of sort of titular head. I don't think he was official chairman, but he sort of ran things. He called the meetings. He did most of the communication with uh, Strother and so forth. And so we came up with this plan. We needed a waste handling facility. We needed a building off campus that would be capable of handling this waste. And we needed to hire a group of people who had expertise in dealing with these sure. chemicals. And so I don't know if you saw this article in the, the newspaper. When was this? October 30th. Made I did the, read the article. Made right. the front page. Yeah. Well, this is now the facility. It's still around. I, I was amused because it says, here's a shelf full of hazard waste. There isn't a single bottle of hazard waste here. <laughs> Those are all labels <laughs> which they hand out. <laughs> so anyway, the university accepted the report. The, the report. Uh -huh. And I'd say within a year or two, this facility was constructed. And Frank Stewart was named the first manager of this waste facility. But this still hasn't got me to chemical management. Mm -hmm. Because about this time of dealing Getting the with this, on the horizon there were winds blowing indicating that OSHA was going to descend on campuses all over the country and make sure that each campus in the United States was in compliance with the OSHA laboratory standards. I mean, safety, things like that. Right. And the university realizing that this was about to fall on their heads said they have to set up committees to deal with these matters. So there were two or three committees organized. There was, I think, a biological health committee. There was the chemical management committee and some other committee. Bill had left chemistry. Bill Bakinger had left chemistry by now. He'd gone into the president's office. He was dealing with patents. In fact, he's still there. He's now, I think, vice president of research for the university. And so, now having Bill to choose as chairman, they opted for me as the chairman of the chemical management committee. And that's where my work started. We took over the management of this facility. I have a list here I'll give you of okay. one of the early people rosters of people who are on the committee, and I think there are probably some names that you recognize. Mm -hmm. um, Van Sickle was head of the Vets School. 
Wukash. Ron Wukash. Who's now deceased. You're right. Neil is still Neil is still Neil's head. head. Neil is head of the, now the current head of the chemical management. He took over when I retired. And Bob Squires, I think. Squire right. was there. Most of the people Suzanne on Nielsen from Food Science. Food Science. I think right. she's now retired. I'm not sure though. McLaughlin. I don't know if Jerry's still around or not. I don't know. Stuart Klein. I reckon Stuart Klein was one of the prime movers on this committee. He was head of REM at right. the time. And he really had extensive chemical background. So uh, is he still? I don't know whether he's still. No, he either. left Purdue a long oh, time okay. ago. Okay. Uh, what's her name? Carol uh, Shelby, I think. Oh, right. I think I recognize. Yeah, who's handling it now. She doesn't have the expertise. Because right. he so had the background. In the I may have seen, talked to Carol once or twice. Stuart, I spent hours with. Anytime there was a major instance on campus, explosion, isn't it? Stuart and I would, would sure. be there. He was always the one I'd push in front of the TV cameras. I didn't want to have anything to do with the TV. And he was very obliging in this regard. Yeah. I was very sorry to see him leave the university. But Stewart, Frank Stewart was the one who was manager of the hazardous waste facility for about 10 years until mm -hmm. he left. And so he had all the problems of developing it. Yeah, and I there bet. were lots of problems. I bet. And I'm not sure I'm going to take the time now to detail them. But I worked hand in hand with Frank because Frank sometimes would not wait for the committee meetings. He'd just show up in my office. He's got a special problem. Would I make recommendations? And then on the bottom, you'll see the signature. See the uh, familiar name, Stan Ham? In pharmacy? No. We reported, this management committee reported to two people the, the chemical management. The chemical management. We reported to Bob Greencorn. Right. who was vice president of research at the time. And we reported to Ken Burns, who was vice pre president of physical facilities. facilities right. This is before he became treasurer. Okay. And when Fred Ford stepped down, Ken moved up into Fred's position. Then Wayne Chonis was the person that came after, that. came after that. Right. I must say, I have nothing but the highest regard for Ken Burns and Wayne Jonas. I mean, they made life very easy for us because they listened. When chemical management deliberated, and we came to a decision, we went to them, and they never overturned a single decision that we made. And particularly when it came to money, the purse is opened. And this waste management facility was very, very, very expensive. Oh, I'm sure. They all. And they oh, were yeah. at the time, came to us at eight weeks. Work out a system for charging for faculty for picking up their waste. And so our management committee met two, three times on this issue. And we finally made a decision for good reason. We can't do this. I think it was Laura Unger who was at the regional campus up north. Said well, she spent summers at Notre Dame. And Notre Dame was charging their faculty to dispose of waste. And some of the faculty were going on at night into the fields in the area and just dumping their waste. Or waste was going down the drain. And so long before the word green was in vogue, we were very green <laughs> in the chemical <laughs> management committee. And we got every bit of cooperation you can imagine from people at the top. I rarely saw or talked with uh, Greencorn. His representative, the intermediary between Green Corn and us was Stan Hem. If he got Stan got word of anything that we were doing that was sort of out of the ordinary, he would call me. Hey, we're not sure if such and such is proper. Maybe you should rethink. It. Or if we wanted to appoint someone to the committee, we had to go through Stan. He would make all the appointments mm -hmm. to the committee. Mm -hmm. okay. So it ended up we worked very, very well with Stan in this regard. He was chair of the Senate some years ago. He was the Senate. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I see Stan. I, I've known him. Well, anyway, let's, I'm, I'm straying here. Let's get back to OSHA laboratory standards. Because the biggest stick we had at the time was OSHA had investigated certain universities and applied a $100,000 fine, half a million dollar fine. I think Yale got hit with a million dollar because they weren't in 
Right. This is the best. These fines are never low. This is Any? best stick we had. In fact, OSHA still investigates this campus. No one knows. They come. They, they can come unannounced, can't they? Well, generally, but they, we've got good working relationship. Oh, okay. Because generally they will announce they're coming about a day or two in advance. And frequently, I don't understand this, they'll say what particular facilities <laughs> they want to visit. So uh, fortunately, some people get some forewarning that their facility is going to be inspected by OSHA. And despite this, they do find violations, but never sufficiently severe that they find. In other camps. places. Other places they have. Yeah. Anyway. How do we get this compliance? Well, first of all, we had RAM write books of rules and regulations. This has been around campus all over for years and years. I bookmarked the place where we wrote the requirements of what the Chemical Management Committee was supposed to do. I was at the page, yeah. Okay. And so if you want to know what the duties were, well, I'll, I'll make a copy and then I'll return it. No, you can have that. There are uh, plenty of copies all over all campus. Right. <laughs> we flooded the campus with those okay. things. So I'll donate it to the archives. And then guidelines for handling and disposal of chemicals. We sent this around to everybody on campus, and you can see where it originated from. Somehow my name got stuck on one of the first issues. Unfortunately, I asked them to remove it in later versions, so there are many of these things that went around okay. campus. Yeah, and the archives and sticking stories. with chemicals, here is a, a report that came from this waste handling facilities. Mm -hmm. And it will give you some ideas of what the volume was campus-wide. Because mm -hmm. this just wasn't from buildings, it came from physical plant as well. Well, anyway, we had to write the guidelines for compliance with the OSHA regulations. And putting this into effect campus-wise was, I must say, quite a task. We called just about every department on campus asking whether they had You asked about safety chairman. We asked whether they had a safety chairman for their building. We discovered most didn't. We said, well, you have to have it. So some department heads just took it on themselves. They became safety chairman. Others appointed people. We had a gathering. All people involved with safety over here in Stewart Center. We had about 100 people. We explained to them what was coming on the line, what we had to correct on campus, what safety violations were in eye protection, dealing with things, not throwing things down the drain, not allowing things to go up the smokestacks and so forth. And then we had a questionnaire sent to every single faculty on campus where we solicited a response. Did they deal with chemistry? Were they involved with any of these things? A large majority came back with the answer, no. Those that said yes, we made up a list. So we had a list. Everybody on campus who in any way dealt with chemicals. And then we sent REM in to visit and deal with each and every one of these faculty members. Each and every one had a personal interview where the questions were asked how they were handling their research, how they were handling their storage. I suspect even the library, you do printing, printing inks and so forth. Yeah, so I, you know, I have a feeling someone contacted probably. those people responsible to see whether they were handling it properly. But this was a very major undertaking, which largely was the work that we carried out. We were sort of in the background. We, we, we suggested things and Stuart Klein and his group would go out and beat the bushes and do the work for us. And so this all got done. So we are now in compliance and we've been in compliance for That's years great. and years and years. That's great. This will be very helpful to me, this material. Good. Okay, so there was the waste, there was the compliance, and then finally non-smoking. It originated from this chemical management committee. We were the first to put a smoking, non-smoking policy in place. And it's evolved tremendously, so there are things now that we had no involvement whatsoever. But the first non-smoking policy came out of chemical management. And that's a long story, too. I don't know if you want to hear it. We'll keep that. We'll see. You know, 
uh, that's, that's because interesting. There was Ken Burns that pushed this. I'll tell you a little bit, the background. Okay. Yeah. Apparently, there was a movement afoot around the universities in the country to start putting non-smoking policies into effect. And apparently, Purdue looked at this, and they put together regulations. These regulations were sent and discussed with the physical plant, because that's where most of the heavy smoke was there. It was discussed with all the service personnel, the secretaries. It was never discussed with the faculty. The policy was written, was sent to Fred Ford, and it disappeared from his desk. Never reappeared. He essentially put a pocket veto. And for whatever reason, no one to this day knows, but it got vetoed there. And about five years later, Ken Burns said, well, we really need a non-smoking policy for this campus. So he called me and said, we need this smoking policy. I'm going to send you this big packet of material from what had happened five years earlier. Go over it, use what you can, but come back to me with some rules and regulations. And the management committee did. And selling this to campus was quite a task because we divided up. I gave the responsibility to two or three people on the committee. One had to talk to people in the physical plant. So they met with representatives, question and answer. This is what we're going to have. Are there objections? I met personally with the service personnel group. I forgot what the title of this group is. But about 20, 25 people, representatives all over campus, secretaries, so forth. And I explained. The clerical and the clerical. Right. right. This is what the rules and regulations are going to be. Do you have objections? you have suggestions, say so now. And we left that meeting with unanimous support. And I figured we got to take this to the faculty. And so I contacted the head of the chemical engineering department, who was chairman of the University Center Resources Committee. Well, I think his committee that sort of channels the agenda for the Senate meetings. And I said, we're coming up with this smoking policy. I like have you bring it to the attention of your committee? Which he did. And he said, would you meet with us and answer questions that we've got? I said, fine. So I was there. And Ken Burns went with me. Resource committee is a small group. Fred Ford was a member of this resource committee. He didn't have any objections. But they agreed unanimously that it had to go forward. And Ford said, OK, it's done. I said, no, it's not done. This has got to go to the full Senate. Full se oh, no, it doesn't have to go. To I said, yes, it has to go to the full Senate. And fortunately, I was given the backing by Ken Burns, so this thing went to the full Senate. And you can find probably Senate meetings where it was minutes that it was on the agenda. I was there along with about four or five people from Rim. We didn't say a word. We were just visitors. And I must say it was a hot, contentious discussion on this smoking policy. No one was against it. The dissension was that it, a lot of the faculty felt it didn't go far enough because this smoking policy was such that every building could have a designated smoking area. And so the Senate approved this. And then it went into effect. So smoking signs started going up around the campus. And then later, individual schools, individual departments started to heighten the regulations. And so these re designated areas were thrown out so that there was no smoking allowed. Chemical management had nothing to do with that. And that now you could smoke within 10 feet of a building. And there are signs places you can smoke within 30 feet of a building. And they're out there winds blowing, suggest there's not going to be any smoking allowed anywhere on campus. We've had no involvement with these later it's developments. It's interesting how that has evolved. We just, we just got the first right. regulations sure. in place. Right. And I think that pretty much tells you about 
what happened with my chemical management yeah, that's years. Very, very good. Because I was a long stretch of years serving on that committee from the late 80s. But it turned to be very fruitful. We got a lot done. Well, and it was very, it came in at the time when it was really needed. Did I get recognition for it? You never know. You never know. No, no really. I, I really mean this because once I, I passed my department head in the hallway and said, gee, you know, I just had a discussion with some of the people at the top of the university. You've been doing all kinds <laughs> of things. <laughs> so I had no I idea moved about silently, it. silently, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk uh, to Pac Fellow. Let's change it. Uh, just tell about the Pac Fellow. Well, that's really not much to tell about. Uh, were you there? I was at Wiley Hall, yeah, right. for maybe around eight, nine, ten years. Yeah. And we used to go over Tuesday nights for dinner. My wife and I, we used to plop down. Students would look aghast at us when we sat down with sure. them. But we ended up probably spending half hour, 45 minutes after eating just discussing. Right. Yeah. They, well, that's part of it. The they generally yeah. ended up with a good feeling. But then our, our youngest daughter at the time, she was still, what, probably finishing up grammar school. We used to drag her over. She didn't like this. And then when she started high school, she said she was, just became too busy with the fence to go with us. And so we sort of stopped going right. as well. Yeah. Let's talk about family. Uh, did, you have, did your children go to Purdue? No. Oh, okay. No, I have five children. How many? You have five children. Five. Okay. Where did they Guess go Guess where school? they went. <laughs> did some go to IU? Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, All right. five. Okay. Uh, put a lot of financial support in <laughs> paying tuition at IU. Five undergraduate degrees, one medical degree at IU. Where does, is it a girl or boy? Girl. Uh, where does she, does she, what sort of position is she? She's an internist okay. in she's Munster. She lives in Munster. Oh, okay. She does, actually, her practice is in Hammond. And her husband is a plastic surgeon who has his own practice in Munster. And they have three kids. And the oldest I suspect he'll become a physician. He's a unique individual. He calls his own shots. He doesn't listen to anybody's advice. How old is he in high school? Or? Oh, he's a junior now at Case Western. Oh, is he really? You know, he, he's eligible to graduate after three years, but he's not sure he's going to graduate. He thinks maybe he'll want to just take another year. Just year of some semi-leisure on his part <laughs> to do what he feels like doing. And he's Before got he goes to the next stage. <laughs> yeah. He says he's going to spend the year studying for Metcats. Which for him, I don't think he has to study for <laughs> Metcats. Yeah. You know, when he took chemistry in high school, they had segments dealing with organic chemistry. Never once did he ask for assistance. In fact, he used to bring the textbook open the page and then ask me. He used to quiz me <laughs> about what was in the text. <laughs> now, when his sister took chemistry, she used to call just about every night. <laughs> and we used to spend a lot of time <laughs> going over things with, with Alex Never. In fact, he was very proud of the fact he took organic chemistry last year at Case Western. So he never went to class. Oh, very what good. What do you mean, no? I don't need to go to class. It's boring. I just take the textbook, and I read the text. Now I get my A+. Plus. <laughs> and he did get his A+. Plus. He just learned it on his own. Yeah. Went there for the exams. Mm. Took take the, the exams. exams. Took yeah. the exams. Didn't go to class. Mm. But he said, as like I say, he's sort of a special breed. Took physics, was the top of the class, and then the physics professor hired him as a grader <laughs> next year. <laughs> so he was doing some more grading, other physics papers. Did a lot of volunteer work in the Case Western system. They've got a big hospital system. How did he happen to select that, do you think, Case Western? I wish I knew. He did it. It wasn't my advice. It wasn't his parents' advice. He had just shopped around, looked into institutions around the country. Okay. I have a feeling that their medical Leaning. I have a very good medical school. It's long, long term. Yeah. 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 Just the school, Cleveland Clinic being in the area and so right. forth. So. Yeah, it's a good, and it's a great location because it's where that 
where the uh, symphony is and things of that sort. Now, the yeah. fact that he's going to take Metcats leads me to believe he'll probably go yeah, to medical right. school. He okay. said his, both his parents are in these two grandparents on this, his father's side, and these, his uncle is a renowned <laughs> surgeon, and MD. Sounds his like grand, grandparents on that other side of the family were all MDs, so. Why as well father join the group? I right. think that's why I think he had reservations. You know, these young people sometimes have rebellion. In them. And I think there's a little bit of rebel boiling up within, which I think is coming down. Coming down, yeah. Well, I'll t talk just a couple minutes about retirement. What, uh, any special activities? Just the Florida mm -hmm. thing? That's yeah, nice. Florida, yeah. yeah. Do a lot of beach combing. Do a lot of hiking on the beach. That's nice. And lots of activities in the Sarasota area to keep us occupied. Sure. What about a big, do you have a Purdue tradition that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? Or how about an outstanding event? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Okay. Nothing that really sticks out like a okay. sore thumb. Okay. There are just too many little things okay. that happen along the way. Then I'll let you uh, make some closing comments or something that I didn't ask that you'd like to share. Anything? Well, I think I've talked enough about <laughs> this and that. Oh, yes. One thing. Uh -huh. The chemistry building. Right. Brown. That was on your Yes, that's thing. right. Right. And it was anything I had... I had given no thought to it whatsoever until you alerted me to it. Yeah, I was engaged in the planning of that note on the Brown facility. Mm -hmm. There are things about planning that facility that absolutely no one knows about. No one in chemistry, no one on the outside. I'll give you a name. Herm Andres. You ever come across that name? Mm -hmm. You know about Herm? Mm -mm. Okay. He, was he in what department? What are you been? He was a vice president of research. No, he was an executive assistant to our department head. He never was outside of chemistry. When he left chemistry, he went to Great Lakes Chemical. There is where the kick in, right? And I think yeah. rose to the position of vice president, then left Great Lakes and became venture capitalism and then passed away right. 10, 15 years ago. That's A-N-D-R-E. Is that the way that I think it's A-N-D-R-E-S, I think. Oh, okay, okay. I think there might have been an, um, maybe my memory isn't And his right. wife passed away not too long in the last uh, couple of years. But if anyone deserves credit for that brown building, mm -hmm. it is Andre. And I'm not, just, I'm not saying just minor amount of credit. I mean Substantial, just about every facet, every aspect of that building. He was involved he had his, in. He was involved with. Yeah. And he was responsible. Now, Guy Mellon on the outside was given lots of credit for the Brown Building. Now, Guy served, we had an architectural committee, which I served in. Guy was a member of that committee. He drew up things for locker orientations. He was present the committee like your six different ways in which you can put the lockers. But that was largely his contribution. In fact, there was a point where he just got teed off with uh, all the recognition and everything that Andre was doing, and he resigned. He just stepped away huh. from the planning. And then when Andre left the chemistry department, this is about the time that this construction was just starting, Guy Mellon came back. And Guy Mellon tremendous service by sort of monitoring, supervising the construction. He'd be in there while they were pouring concrete to make sure they were pouring <laughs> the concrete properly. <laughs> but there were really two or three major issues about that brown building. One, where was it going to be located? There was a year and a half to two year fight on this between Herm Andre and Wally Joe Bush. Joe Bush at the time was the university architect. And Joe Bush was insisting that we have to butt this new building into Heaven Hall. Heaven Hall had a disastrous air handling system. Their ventilation was atrocious. And this was the way they were going to solve. We're going to build you a new chemistry building, and we're going to take care of this old Heaven Hall. And chemistry would have nothing to do with it. No reason to get us mixed up with the speech and audiology department. No sense giving up space of this new building to speech and audiology to correct 
this long-standing problem. And as I say, this battle went on for about a year and a half or more, and it cost us finishing up the fifth floor of the Brown Building when it was constructed. We didn't have the funds because inflation was rampant in those days. It took us three, four, five years to get the funds to finally finish the fifth floor of Brown. But the way this problem was resolved is that a meeting was called. Lyle Freehaver, was treasurer at the time, he called this meeting. The dean of the humanities school, Morris Hobo, the dean of science, Felix Haas, a few representatives from speech and audiology, a few representatives from our architectural committee. I was there, sat in the background and listened. Hobo gave about a 15, 20 minute presentation as to why speech and audiology should be involved. Phil Haas got up and summarized this statement less than a minute, maybe two minutes at most. I don't remember what he said, but what he said was right to the heart of the matter. It drove an arrow right into the heart of the situation. When Haas was done talking, he said the meeting is coming to an end. This decision has been made. I'm going to rule in favor of chemistry being separated completely from having, having its own location. So that was one thing that Andre accomplished, because he was the one that fought tooth and nail. The other thing was design of the chemistry building. You know, Walter Scholler is well known around campus as being the campus architect. It's supposed to 90% of that chemistry building was planned by the chemistry department not by Walter Scholler. And of that 90%, the major work was done by Herm Andre. Yeah, that's interesting. If you get the plans and you see how the department building is laid out, it wasn't Scholler, it was Andre. At one end you put offices, then you put a laboratory, and then you put a service facility in between, and then another laboratory. This service facility was unique. It was Andre's idea. In fact, I got drawing somewhere in my lap where Mellon made drawing the Andre <laughs> rearrangement. Uh, and you go through that building, it's Andre. Every floor, every level. Now, there are other faculty that made contributions. For example, but he was a major one, really. He, he drew up, his baby. He right. drew up the plan, he drew up the scheme. You know, Shoulder drew up the outside of the building. They decide what was going to go into these service shafts, the water and the gas and all this kind of stuff. It was a unique plan. We had this service shaft where all the utilities branch out into two areas. And this is repeated over and over down the line. The teaching labs were planned by a group of faculty. I was one of those. Exactly how the lab would be laid out. Shoulder didn't lay out our teaching lab. This well, group. you people have the expertise for that. Well, we wanted to have a situation where all the students faced in one direction. We wanted a situation where the TA would have good control over what was going on. So we suggested a raised platform at the front of the room with a bench where the TA could stand and look, or the TA could get off the platform and go mingle. We looked at the locker configurations, the drawers, that was Mellon's contribution because he gave us all kinds of suggestions. We picked what we thought was the best. Mm -hmm. We did mock-ups. Oh, you're familiar with the Michael Golden shop. There was the building that was worth Brown now this place. It was totally empty at the time. We used to go over there and do mock-ups for the laboratory, carbon curtains. We used to measure the distance between one very curvy, well, this inch here, no, inch there, and we very carefully came to find a lot of work that goes into that. And it was, I think, work very time very well spent because I think those laboratories are a good model yeah. for what laboratory, teaching laboratories should be. Hal Carter planned the general chemistry office. <laughs> he drew up the plan. Hal Carter was a professor who taught general chemistry. He drew up the plan for the general chemistry office. I know because I had drawn up the plan myself. It stunk. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> his, his plan is what they have now. Sure. My only contribution in drawing up was the organic office on the floor. 
I drew up where the offices should be, where other facilities should be, but that was a little, little teeny nothing. That's right. Every, every, every penny counts. So, I, it's unfortunate, even around the chemistry department, I've talk, discussed this with some of the senior faculty. Andre? Who's Andre? They don't realize that, really. That's he was the power. It was his baby. Yeah. Now, Weatherall was Mellon's baby. Mm -hmm. A lot of the planning of the Weatherall building was his doing. And I know where he got his ideas. He copied chemistry building, Baker Laboratory at Cornell. The Weatherall was a spitting image of what Baker Laboratory used to be at Cornell, no longer because Baker Laboratory has been totally refitted. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like the old Baker. Sure, it doesn't look anything like the weather it does. So yeah, that sort of completes my service. I made minor contributions there. But I really feel someone ought to know. It's very nice. This yeah. was a Herm Andre facility. Now, I understand why it was named the Brown Building. Brown had nothing to do with the planning and the construction. You win a Nobel Prize. Yeah. You can get a building. Well, it was named, was it named at the dedication or not? I can't recall. Or maybe it was afterwards. I can't remember. I don't really recall the yeah. timing there. I know. And I don't even recall whether it was named before or after he won the Nobel. He was, Herb was always a power within the um, chemistry department. I've seen when the date and the invitation of the dedication and everything, and it, I think it was just the building, and it may have been afterwards, I don't know, because he got it in 79. So. Yeah, I, I'm terrible at dates these days. Also getting terrible with names. <laughs> uh, well, I really appreciate this. It's been well, I've really enjoyed it. My my pleasure. And I want to thank you very Good much. To sort of vent on things that it's I nice haven't vented on ever. <laughs> because I was a time I, I don't recall one instance where I went into the department heads out. And, you know, like I know a lot of my colleagues did, I want this <laughs> and that. And fortunately if I had to do things again. I would learn how to say no, because I never knew how to say yeah. no. I'm, I'm I experienced that. People suggested, you do this? Go you ahead do and do it. it. That's do right. It. You, yeah. do it. you do it with the best of your ability. You don't make a big deal of it. You don't have big fanfare. I've got colleagues somewhere in chemistry. I've got, they've got trumpets and blow their horn <laughs> every, every <laughs> single opportunity. Uh, I'm sure there are many like that. On oh, there are a lot of people that are like that. Thank you.